Hello. In this video, we'll talk about characterization, introductory concepts. We're going to talk about the basics, why characterization matters, how it fits into the, to the big picture with respect to tax, and how it ultimately affects the outcome on the tax return. Now, the first place I want to start is talking about the five questions. And I usually talk about these five questions. If you recall, whenever you have a transaction in front of you, an income tax, you should always address five questions. The first question is what amount of income? What amount of income, if any? So if there's any gross income, what amount? Determine the amount. The second question is what amount of deduction or credit or outflow? So what amount of deduction, credit, or outflow? Again, determine the specific amount. So deduction, credit, or outflow. So this is dealing with losses. Income of gains, losses, um, deductions. The third question deals further with the first two. When? When do you have income or when do you have a deduction, credit, or outflow? So the when question, the timing question. When? When do you have? This is timing. Timing is very important in tax, and I have many videos that discuss this point because time value money, a dollar of tax savings today is worth more than a dollar in the future. And in general, a taxpayer likes to defer income recognition and accelerate loss or deduction recognition. So that's a very important concept in all of tax. So timing ends up being one of the biggest components in all of tax. The next question is who? Who has income? Who has a deduction? Now this is an area of tax that a lot of tax classes tend to leave out of the curriculum. It's more of what people think of as an advanced topic, but it's really important because it's possible to have assignment of income issues where somebody assigns their income or deduction to another person. But ultimately the person that assigns, even though they don't receive the cash or whatnot, they might actually have to pay income on the item. Now this is an area that's, that's very much determined by case law. Supreme Court cases, Lucas vs. Earl, Halvering vs. Horse are some of the big cases. Uh, it's a huge issue and um, you'll see more videos on this topic in the future. So please look out for those, those videos. Finally, the last question, when you're looking at the five questions that you always look at whenever you have a transaction in front of you for income tax purposes, is the character, the characterization. What is the character of the item of income, loss, deduction, credit? What's the character? Now, credit is just a credit. But when it comes to um, income and deductions, we have to look at the character. All right? Now, when we're looking at property transactions, and that's going to be a big element in this discussion because characterization deals with property transactions. I'll explain why in a few moments. But property transactions... We have three specific questions with respect to property transactions. And this is a subset of the five questions that we have here. So this is the five questions. I call these the adverb questions because, you know, when you learned about adverbs in school, it was the who, what, when, where. But I just call them the five questions of income tax that we ask in income tax. The five questions of income tax. We ask that in every, transa every transaction. And you can address a fact pattern by looking at those five questions. I, that's how I would go through it. And if something isn't relevant, then you address why it's not relevant. Property transactions. We've been talking about transactions involving property, sales, exchanges, and whatnot of property. And we're continuing with that with the characterization issue. So the three questions that we always address with respect to property transactions, the first is, what is the realized gain or loss? the realized gain or loss of the transaction when we have property. Now you have to have a sale or other disposition. So what it is, we can, and you can look at other videos discussing the realized gain or loss, please look at that. It's the amount realized minus adjusted basis. And I have various videos that define those terms. So realized gain or loss is the amount realized minus the adjusted basis. The next question is what is the recognized gain or loss? So some realized gains or losses might not be recognized. Recognized gain or loss is what matters, what goes on the tax return, or what ultimately goes on to the next step. 
And finally, the third step, and that's what this discussion is all about in many other videos, is the character of the recognized gain or loss. The character of the gain or loss. Character of gain or loss. So let's talk about why character really matters. So the reason that character really matters, I'll just be, I'm just going to be straightforward, straight shooter with you. I'm going to tell you, the reason that character matters is because some types of gain and loss can have a lower rate than other types of gain or loss. Very important. So it's all about preference. Character matters. Character matters because preference. There's preferential items possible. And of course, if you're advising a taxpayer, you're going to want to advise them to have a lower tax rate because that's going to save them money. When you're talking about income, when you're talking about deductions, you want to have a higher rate because it provides more tax benefit. Now, ultimately, there's really two types of characterizations in the end. There's two types of characterizations in the end. There's ordinary and there's capital, ultimately. Ordinary and capital. Those are ultimately the two types. Now, there's some special items, and you're going to learn about these in later videos, that deal with Section 1231 and various recapture provisions. But really, what it comes down to is the two types of character out there. Ordinary and capital. Now, all ordinary is ordinary. There's no distinction. But with capital, capital is broken into short-term and long-term. So capital is further broken into short-term and long-term. Okay? Now, where does that preference come, come into play? The preference comes into play, well, it really depends on what kind of item you have. So here is the preference. Let's talk about the preferential items. So if you're a taxpayer, and this is a general rule. This doesn't apply in every case, but this is in general. In general. So with respect to preferences, so we have our preferential items. What does a taxpayer want if they can get it, what they want? Okay, preferential items. If we have gain or income, the taxpayer is going to want long-term capital gain. Long-term capital gain. If the taxpayer can make that happen, they want long-term capital gain. If there's a loss, which is a deduction, an outflow, then the taxpayer wants ordinary. And there's two reasons, and I've already alluded to the main reason. The two reasons for this is because, one, preferential rates. When we have gain, we pay income. It's income, right? We pay income tax. Preferential rates. The gain, a long-term capital gain, has a lower rate than ordinary. Historically, historically, if we look at the last, since 1946 until the late 1900s, historically the average long-term capital gain, LTCG rate, historically the average is 28%, the highest rate, 28%. However, the historically, between 1940, the 1946, right after World War II, and the end of the 1900s, the highest ordinary income rate is over 60%, greater than 60%. So potentially, someone can save half in tax by getting a gain that is taxed at a preferential rate. That's, that's a huge element. Now, the other item, and this is why we prefer losses that are ordinary, is because capital losses are limited. There's various limitations on capital losses, on certain losses. And we've learned about those limitations in other videos that you can see, but this is really where we get to that, where we get to the characterization. Also, when it comes to a loss, right, with a loss, right, when we get a tax benefit, we want to make sure that we get a greater tax benefit. If you have ordinary income and you have capital gain, you rather have 
a loss that offsets the ordinary income from the capital gain because if you can save 60%, potentially, if you look at it historically, 60% rather than 28%, you'd rather save the 60%, right? Be taxed at the 28% and not be taxed at the ordinary. That's better than the opposite, than being taxed at the ordinary and not being taxed at long-term capital gain. So the loss provides greater benefit. So number two and number three deal with losses. This is why we have a preference for losses. And then the first one, the preferential rates, that's why we prefer long-term capital gain. Now, within long-term capital gain, there's some special items such as collectibles and what we call undercaptured section 1250. And I'll talk about those items in later videos, but it's possible that they get actually a higher rate than the normal long-term capital gain preferential rates. That could be possible. And at one time, it was all the same. Um, but over time, certain long-term capital gain actually had lower rates, 15 20%. And then collectibles had 28%. So there's actually groupings within the long-term capital gain category. Now, short-term capital gains end up, practically speaking, being taxed as ordinary income. So that's an important element to understand. So one thing I want to mention before we continue is why exactly do we have a preference? So why? Why do we have this preference? Why is there the preference? And why, just like many things in income tax, the reason, the, the why question is usually addressed from the sense of tax policy. Tax policy. And this one usually is an efficiency argument. Remember efficiency, we have, we have um, equity, which is fairness. Simplicity, which is, okay, how simple is our tax system so it doesn't make it difficult for both the taxpayer and the government to um, enforce. And then efficiency is economics. There's certain transactions, capital transactions, that maybe we want to promote in our economy. Investment. Maybe we want people to invest in our businesses and we want to encourage that. So that's there's lots of arguments for why exactly we have a preference for capital over, say, labor, you know, making money um, through wages. But this is something to invest through capital. And there's other reasons why, and there's other reasons why we shouldn't have it. But and I'm not going to go into the uh, the deep the deep dive here. But it's a it's a, a big part of it is efficiency. Maybe we want to encourage certain transactions, certain investments. There's trickle down economics arguments and whatnot. Whether you agree with that or not is a different discussion. But it really is heavily based on economics. That's why capital, specifically long term capital gain, gets over or gets preferential treatment a lower rate than ordinary. Again, 28 percent top rate over 60%. So you might be wondering, well, how do very wealthy people out there, billionaires, why aren't they taxed at, you know, 60, 70, 80% rates like they were in the old time or back in the old times? And the answer is they weren't. Many very wealthy individuals invest a lot in the stock market or various investments, and they pay 28% while we're working at wage levels and we're getting hit with a higher tax rate, maybe 40%. Very, very, very big thing. And this is also an equity issue. So it brings into, into issue equity. And that's why things like the alternative minimum tax came about. Um, that's one part of it. I mean, alternative minimum tax doesn't really address fully the capital argument. But again, that's been a, a fierce debate um, for the last century is should we allow a preference for capital? So that's one thing to understand. Now, the difference between short-term and long-term capital gains will be discussed in a later video. But again, it's important to understand that long-term capital gains are what we strive to get when we look at preferential items. And again, that's for gains. If we have losses, we want ordinary because capital losses are severely limited. And you'll learn about that later on. And then if you have a loss, it provides a greater tax benefit because ordinary losses will be able to offset ordinary income versus capital losses generally um, are able to offset capital income. That's the general rule. Now, one last thing I want to discuss is how exactly do we get long-term capital gain treatment? And normally, this is under normal conditions, there's a few special ways. There's a provision called Section 1231, which I'll discuss in later videos. But normally, how do we get long-term capital gain? There's really three elements to how you get long-term capital gain. First is you have to have a sale or exchange. Now, sale or exchange has its own definition. Remember when we talk about realized gain or loss? We talk about sales or other dispositions. Well, sale or exchange has its own definition. Sale or exchange, you have to have sale or exchange. So this is why when you get wages, 
there's no sale or exchange because nothing was sold or exchanged. Sale generally connotes that property is being converted to cash. Exchange generally connotes that property is being converted for other property that's not similar materially in any kind. I know it's a similar definition to sale or other disposition like we talked about in previous videos, but I'm telling you it actually is a, a separate set of the law. So you have to have sale or exchange. If you don't have sale or exchange, you can never get long-term capital gain. It's automatically going to, or short-term capital gain. You can't have capital. It's going to be ordinary. Okay. You need sale or exchange to get capital. If you don't have that, you can only be ordinary. Okay. The next element is you have to have a capital asset. And I'm going to talk about what a capital asset is. You can see in other videos. You have to have a capital asset. The definition of capital asset will be discussed in future videos. Okay. Now again, it's possible you can still get long-term capital gain without capital asset or sale or exchange, but normally under normal conditions, the basic, the plain vanilla, you need a sale or exchange and a capital asset. Finally, so you need number one, number two to be a capital item. The final requirement to get long-term is you have to have a long-term holding. And long-term simply means that the asset has been held for more than one year. So a year or less will be short-term. More than one year is long-term. So to get capital treatment, we need number one and number two down here. We need number one, number two. Short-term versus long-term is defined by number three. It's been held for more than one year. All right. So this is just a general dis discussion of when you're considering a transaction, how do we get to the character issue? That usually is the last thing addressed. The property tra transaction questions. Why character matters? Again, because of the preference. If we have a preference and we have a gain, we want long-term capital gain because it has a lower rate. If we have a loss, we want ordinary because there's less limitations on ordinary losses and it provides a greater tax benefit because you can offset ordinary income, which has the higher rate. Okay? Again, when we're looking at character, ultimately, there's ordinary and capital. Capital is broken between short-term and long-term. Why do we ever have, why was this preference ever developed? Because under tax policy, the efficiency argument, the economics argument, there's a argument that maybe we should encourage certain capital investment in our economy. Maybe that will grow our economy. And whether you agree or disagree with that is, again, um, something for you to look into further. I'm not going to go into the politics of that. And there's other reasons for um, having a preference and other reasons, and there's lots of reasons for against having it. One reason I addressed was fairness. Why should somebody that's working from the sweat of their brow making wages, right? Why should they be taxed at 40% when someone that's a billionaire be taxed at 20%? The person that makes, that has billions of dollars, they ha they can they can afford to pay tax better. That's an argument. That's not what I'm saying. That's, that's argument some people have made. Finally, to get that long-term capital gain under normal treatment, well, to get capital treatment, you have to have number one and number two, sale or exchange and capital asset. To get long-term, you have to have held the asset for um, more than one year. All right, I hope you've enjoyed this video. There's more um, characterization videos, so please make sure you find them and watch them because this is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to characterization.